Welcome to Module 8. This is the eighth installment in the Emerging Infectious Disease videos for pre-hospital provider series. In this video, we will be discussing transport considerations for patients with highly infectious diseases and operational considerations for the use of portable isolation units. This instructional series was created by the University of Maryland Baltimore County Department of Emergency Health Services with assistance from the Maryland Department of Health, the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems, and funding from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In this module, we will introduce the roles for first arriving units and designated transport units. We will discuss transport considerations such as cross-contamination and provider well-being while wearing PPE when providing care for patients under investigation for Ebola virus disease or other highly infectious diseases such as avian influenza or H5N1, smallpox, multidrug resistant TB, SARS, and MERS. We will explore the considerations and equipment for specialized ambulance units when transporting patients with known or suspected highly infectious diseases. We will also review suggested protocols for breaches in PPE, ill or injured personnel, and ambulance crashes or disabled vehicles. Finally, we will explore operational considerations for portable isolation units or isopods and procedures for the event of an isopod breach or PAPR failure. Let's begin with some definitions of first arriving units and designated transport units. First arriving units are often the first EMS units to arrive on scene and would alert dispatch and medical control to the possible presence of a highly infectious disease such as Ebola. Designated transport units are specially trained personnel and ambulances that are specifically designed and supplied for patients with highly infectious diseases. These units would assume patient care from the first arriving units and transport the patient under investigation to the designated hospital. Now that we understand the roles of first arriving units and designated transport units, let's discuss some important considerations for patient transport for those with suspected highly infectious diseases. Methods to decrease the risk of cross-contamination. Providers can use the following techniques to decrease the risk of cross-contamination while providing patient care. Perform regular hand hygiene by washing your hands and using alcohol-based hand sanitizers before and after patient care. Request for the scene to be secured by hazmat and local law enforcement as needed. Do not allow family members or patient belongings in the driver's compartment. Limit the use of needles and other sharps as much as possible. Use appropriate decontamination methods to clean the stretcher wheels between patient care areas and other medical equipment that may have become contaminated. Transfer clean medical records between providers and the hospital. When providers are in PPE for up to four hours at a time, please consider the following. Providers should wear breathable clothing and don the appropriate diaper or bladder protection. Additionally, before donning PPE, providers should drink at least 8 ounces of water, eat a small meal such as a protein bar, and use the restroom if possible. Finally, providers must remove and stow all personal items such as rings and watches and pull back long hair if present. If a provider wears glasses, they should be secured with a neck strap behind the provider's head. Prior to transporting patients under investigation for highly infectious diseases, such as Ebola, certain procedures should be followed to limit the contamination of ambulance surfaces. Some jurisdictions employ ambulance wrapping techniques, which cover nearly all internal surfaces of the ambulance patient compartment with plastic barriers to reduce the risk of contamination. Other services transport patients under investigation for highly infectious diseases in commercial patient containment units such as isopods. The following sections outline some guidelines for ambulance wrapping and preparation as recommended by ASPR. We will discuss three major components of specialized ambulance preparation, applying barriers, equipment readiness, and climate controls. Please note, providers should always follow their jurisdictional protocols for ambulance preparation for the transport of patients under investigation for highly infectious diseases. The following are some guidelines for applying barriers to the patient compartment of an ambulance 
prior to transport of patients under investigation for highly infectious diseases. Providers should apply clear plastic sheets or a similar impermeable barrier to the ceiling and duct tape them in place. When applying barriers, be sure to overlap all seams by at least one inch. Apply sheets to the walls of the patient compartment, cutting holes for air supply and exhaust vents. Providers should then seal any passages between the driver compartment and the passenger compartment with plastic sheeting and protect the floor and benches with clear plastic sheets, cutting holes for the stretcher locks. A large bag or plastic sheet may be used for the jump seat and the stretcher should be protected with an impervious sheet. At this point, all surfaces should be protected by plastic and providers can move on to preparing their equipment for transport. When transporting patients under investigation for highly infectious diseases, it is beneficial to prepare the necessary equipment prior to any contact with the patient. When preparing the ambulance, alcohol-based hand sanitizer and a spill kit or absorbent disposable rags should be kept immediately available. Essential medical equipment should be stowed in the patient compartment and sealed inside a clear plastic bag for easy access. Providers should pre-pack medical supplies into individual plastic bags with sliding closures for ease of access. Services may elect to reorganize the bags or kits to minimize any extra contents or to make cleaning easier. Additional medical equipment should be stowed in the patient compartment behind the impermeable barriers, protecting it from unnecessary exposure, but available if needed by cutting through the plastic. Finally, oxygen delivery kits should be stowed in the patient compartment and sealed inside a clear plastic bag for easy access. Services may consider using a manual disposable suction unit. The final component of specialized ambulance preparation we will discuss in this module is climate control. All climate controls should be set for fresh outside air, not recirculating air. Additionally, the ventilation system in the driver compartment should be set on high and for fresh outside air. All vents should be open and the exhaust vent in the patient compartment should also be set on high. Please note, if a commercial patient containment system is used, these guidelines may be modified accordingly. Now that we have discussed some guidelines for ambulance preparation, we will review the procedures for applying PPE to patients prior to transport, also known as patient wrap procedures. Patients under investigation for highly infectious diseases may also be asked to wear PPE during transport to protect the healthcare provider and environmental services in the presence of excessive wound drainage, fecal incontinence, or other discharges. The following patient PPE could be used when an isopod is not available and reverse isolation is necessary for a patient under investigation for highly infectious diseases. Patients must have an appropriate mental status and low anxiety level to be able to follow instructions to apply the isolation suit. They also need to be able to tolerate a surgical mask, nasal cannula, or face mask with oxygen as needed. Consider administering anti-nausea medications and monitor the patient for overheating during transport. Providers may consider applying ice packs if the patient appears to be overheating. Some jurisdictions and designated transport units are using commercial patient containment systems called isopods when transporting patients under investigation for highly infectious diseases. In the image seen here, the patient is being prepared to be put in the isopod and the providers are wearing full Ebola PPE. In this section, we will demonstrate the procedures for placing a patient in an isopod and discuss strategies for the event of isopod and PAPR failures. The isopod is a negative pressure individual isolation system that protects providers from contact with highly infectious pathogens and is made of heavy duty, puncture resistant vinyl. The blower batteries have a four hour run life and the filters have an eight hour filter life. The isopod is equipped with gloved access points for access to the patient. Pass through ports at either end of the pod allow for IV, oxygen, and other line access to the patient. Five flexible arches allow for work and patient space, and a restraint strap system secures the patient during transport. 
In this video, you can see providers preparing and constructing an isopod for patient transport. Isopods take an average of 5 to 10 minutes to set up. Pre-hospital providers should follow their standard operating guidelines for setup and patient care activities and consider the use of a bariatric stretcher when using an isopod. The first step in construction is to place the isopod on top of the stretcher and unroll the unit so it spans the length of the stretcher. Secure the pod to the stretcher using the straps and set the spines aside for later use. Next, attach the intake and output filters at the head and foot of the isopod and add filter protectors once they are secured in place. Connect the flexible arches and secure them over the isopod using the spines. Then, connect the blower unit to the hose and attach it to the pod. Once the blower is fastened in place, remove the protective covers and test the battery and airflow. Check the integrity of the arches and spines before raising the vinyl sides and zipping the unit closed from foot to head. Tie off the access ports at the top and bottom of the unit. Once the unit is secured, turn on the blower unit and HEPA filter to initiate negative pressure airflow through the unit. Once the isopod is constructed, it must be prepared for patient use. We will demonstrate this process in the next video. Providers should always follow the manufacturer's instructions and guidelines for isopod construction and use. To prepare the unit for the patient, unzip the isopod, remove the spines, and pull the arches open to lay the unit flat on the stretcher, folding down the sides of the pod. Next, providers will apply sheets and chucks pads to the stretcher. In this video, the providers place an optional sheet with integrated patient movement straps on the stretcher first, followed by regular stretcher linens and chucks pads. Once the sheets are in place, the providers position the patient monitoring wires through the head access port and secure the external section of the access port. The unit is now ready for the patient to be transferred to the stretcher. Prior to loading a patient in the isopod, providers must don the necessary elevated level of PPE to protect themselves from any potential exposure to the infectious pathogen. While in an isopod, a patient generally might wear a gown or other comfortable clothing and remove their personal items. If a patient can walk on their own, they should transfer themselves to the stretcher and lay down on top of the chucks pads. Once the patient is on the stretcher, the providers will then attach the monitoring equipment. Prior to closing the isopod, providers must disinfect their gloved hands with EPA-registered disinfectant wipes to minimize the chance of cross-contamination. Fold the sheets inside the isopod and connect the arches above the patient. The arches will then be connected and secured by the spines. To reduce the chance of contaminating the external surfaces of the isopod, providers must doff the dirty gown and outer gloves in an appropriate doffing area 
and on a new gown and set of gloves prior to completing the isopod construction. Place any necessary resuscitation equipment inside the unit with the patient, bring up the sides of the isopod, and zip the unit from foot to head. If a spine becomes dislodged during this process, place it back into the arch using an EPA-registered disinfectant wipe. At this point, providers can raise the head of the stretcher to make the patient more comfortable and ready the monitor, oxygen, and stretcher for transport. Providers should consider having spare filters readily available in the event that the filters on the isopod become wet. In this situation, providers may perform a hot swap of the filters, during which time the isopod will need to be opened. In the case of a breach of the fabric, seam, or zipper of the isopod, the area should be cleaned with an EPA-approved disinfectant wipe and adhesive tape should be applied to the affected area. If the isopod battery or blower fails, immediately plug the battery into an AC power adapter in the ambulance or on scene if available. If a second backup isopod unit is available, exchange the isopod blower with the backup unit. After completion of each of the steps above, providers should disinfect their gloved hands with an EPA-approved disinfectant wipe, remove and discard the gloves, perform hand hygiene with an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, and don new exam gloves. The exterior surface of the isopod should then be decontaminated with an EPA-approved disinfectant wipe. We will now discuss recommended procedures in the event of a breach in PPE or protocols during transport of patients with known or suspected highly infectious diseases. In the case of PPE breach during patient care, providers should stop patient care activity and wipe the area of the breach with an EPA-approved disinfectant wipe. After the area has dried, apply adhesive tape and perform hand hygiene on your gloved hands with another EPA-approved wipe and don new exam gloves. The suit breach should be reported to your safety officer as soon as possible. In the case of a bodily fluid event, such as vomiting, cover the fluid with absorbent material and wipe from the outside moving towards the center of the spill. After the visible spill is cleaned, use EPA-approved disinfectant wipes to disinfect the contaminated surface. Dispose of the infectious material in a double-bagged, approved biohazard waste container. Sanitize your gloved hands and then immediately discard the gloves in the red biohazard bag. Perform hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand sanitizer and don new gloves. In the case of a battery failure of the PAPR, a clean team member should assist in removing and exchanging the PAPR blower. If the hood of the PAPR is breached, the hood should be cleaned with an EPA-approved disinfectant wipe by wiping away from the ripped area, letting it dry, and securing the area with adhesive tape. Afterwards, the provider should sanitize their gloved hands and then immediately discard the gloves in the red biohazard bag. Perform hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand sanitizer and don new gloves. If a provider becomes unable to provide medical care during transport, dispatch and medical control should be notified immediately. The team member should be taken to a designated doffing area as soon as possible to be evaluated by an additional provider that has donned appropriate PPE. Some jurisdictions travel with two ambulances and two sets of providers for this type of circumstance. Rapid decontamination with an EPA-approved disinfectant wipe, removal of PPE, and clinical care should be provided in a backup ambulance or at the hospital upon arrival. In the event of a motor vehicle crash after patient contact, providers should immediately notify dispatch. In the event of a major crash, dispatch should be notified of a hazmat scenario. A second and potentially third designated transport unit, if not already part of the response, should be alerted in the event of a major crash. The patient under investigation and the providers involved in an ambulance crash should be transported to the hospital in appropriate PPE. Pre-hospital providers involved in the crash should be considered exposed and transported wrapped or in a suit as is available in your jurisdiction. Thank you for joining us for Module 8, 
transport considerations for patients with highly infectious diseases, and operational considerations for the use of isopods. Additional resources can be found in the links below this video. We look forward to sharing the ninth and final module with you that covers the transfer of patient care and an introduction to biocontainment units.